They are an inspiration and a mystery. One of the most fascinating slices we think of the world's population. People who live to be 100 years or older and yet remain healthy, even vigorous. They're clearly doing something right, but what exactly? And now, eternal youth. Is it in a cage around the corner? News tonight of a breakthrough for some pioneering mice. But we always wonder, what does a fountain of youth for rodents reveal for humans? Aubrey de Grey, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you for having me on the show. I guess I have always instinctively assumed that aging is natural, that it's part of the evolutionary process. Am I wrong? You're absolutely wrong. Um, as we know, humans tend to grow old and die, whether we live uh, 70 years or in extreme cases into our 11th or even 12th decade, nonetheless we tend to crumble away and transhumanists believe that instead of accepting this as fate, we recognize that humans are organic robots and no law of nature dictates that organic robots grow old any more than it does silicon robots need to grow old. Exercise. Eat wisely. Love the Lord and people and have a good attitude. As I told you, attitude is 90% and circumstances are 10. So I see transhumanism as a direct descendant of the, of the Enlightenment Humanist Project of challenging every orthodox belief, challenging everything that we currently accept and saying, why can't we do better? And pushing that not just to improving society, just improving education, but asking fundamental questions. Why can't we improve human biology? Why can't we change our genome? Just because it's the way it is doesn't mean it's as good as it can be. Why do we age and die? Why can't we do something about that? Technology is about humanity manipulating nature for its own ends. Whether it's fire or the wheel or antibiotics or anything, what we're doing is taking what's natural and saying, no, that's not good enough, and fixing it. It would be unnatural for us not to do that, to leave something that's bad, like, for example, the ill health of old age, and say, oh, let's not fix that. Well, we're already enhancing our bodies with technology. We do it all the time. <laughs> I'm wearing them right here, right, yeah. Uh, so again, more is better, just go for it. Uh, I mean, we're just meat, you know, electric meat and meat. Uh, it's, not, it's not designed to last very long. It's only designed really long enough to have some offspring and get them up to reproductive age and maybe have grandchildren. That's pretty much it. After that, you know, you're doomed. So um, if we can correct that problem with better technology, I'd say go for it. While some might not see enhancement technologies as being part of medicine, eventually that's how it will be looked at. And right now there's a, there's a tension between what's considered therapy and what's considered enhancement. And that's a line that's not fixed anywhere in the sand. It's a moving sliding scale. So in future, for example, if you, uh, if you have not had perhaps, let's say, a, a, a kind of augmentation to working memory, a, a doctor would look at you and say you are not a normal functioning human being relative to the norm now even though you are you are you would have been considered normal let's say by today's standards so the, suddenly that becomes a medical need and we obviously have provisions in place in our society to make these sorts of you know, you know medical interventions available these differ from country to country some countries have universal health care uh, in some countries obviously as a consumer you're welcome to purchase it or you might be covered with your health insurance policy but ultimately that's the kind of accessibility i think that we're talking about people tend to make a apparently clear distinction between treating a disease or a dysfunction if we're getting a cochlear implant or a new heart valve on the one hand and enhancement on the other but that distinction is really pretty blurry the more you look at it. And I think really it's a matter of, uh, of habit and of what you're used to, because if you get a heart valve replacement, you're just getting back to a very familiar baseline, whereas a more radical enhancement is something new. However, I think what we'll see is that as these become available and tested and safe, that people will very quickly forget their objections. It'll be very much like, um, say, open heart surgery. When that was first introduced, most people, you know, wouldn't realize this now, but most people were horrified by the idea. I mean, not really surprisingly, if you think about it, we're talking about cutting your chest open and sticking our hands in there and moving things around and sewing things up. That actually is a fairly gruesome idea. But now we think, oh, okay, if I have to have it done, you know, I'm not looking forward to it, but everybody does it. I think if we have life extension technologies, if people will very quickly realize the benefits and advantages of those, and their apparent in principle objections will very quickly disappear.
think everybody should be part of that conversation. I think everybody should have an opinion, one way or the other, about the impact of these technologies. First and foremost, because we need to be empowered as individuals to make the kinds of decisions that we need when these technologies start to become available. So, for example, um, do you need to you know, store your own stem cells for future application for the regeneration of your own organs once they start to fail? Um, that's something that people should be having that kind of a conversation. Uh, similarly, you know, are you, how on board are you going to be with the uh, you know, uh, rejuvenation therapies that are going to be working to extend your healthy lifespan? So as we get exposed to something, we become more accustomed to it and it looks less weird. And that weird factor is what provides a lot of the uh, reluctance and resistance to anything that's new. So absolutely, as we see things happen, as we see early adopters try on some new technology and we see it work for them, we'll get accustomed to it and eventually we'll accept it. Yet ultimately, when it comes down to it and when the rubber hits the road, we're talking about individuals making decisions for themselves and for their families and what they, they decide that they need. And this can also be in conjunction with you know, the medical community and the medical establishment. And what your doctor tells you is probably going to be in your best interest. So it ultimately will come down to individual demand and consumer demand. Why not? I mean, we'll get the population control thing. and We're already getting control of the population problem. Uh, so I don't think that's an issue. Improved technologies of food production, no problem. We're, we're getting there already. But in general, as a, as a principle, um, just ask the person who is about to die, would you like another day? They'll all say yes. Would you like another week? Yeah, I'll take another week. How about, how about a month? How about a, another month of high quality living? I'll take it at any price. Okay, how about a year? Oh, a year would be great. How about 10 years? Fantastic. You know, no one's going to go, you know what? Um, I mean, no, I think I don't. I mean, yeah, okay, people commit suicide, okay. But in general, most people will go, yeah, I'll take it. I'll take the technology. And we know this because they already do. This is why healthcare costs are so expensive. This is why people spend 90% of their money in healthcare in the last year of their life. They're fighting to stay alive. There are a certain number of objections that come up uh, frequently, especially when we talk about life extension. There are typical ones about what about overpopulation? What about resources? Won't I become bored? Won't uh, dictators stay on for millions of years ruling their, their countries? Other people complain that uh, it's somehow unnatural, uh, even though human nature has always been about modifying ourselves and changing ourselves. So there are certain standard objections come up. And to me, they're all based on a combination of fear and lack of imagination. Essentially, what people usually do when they think about these, these distant scenarios, they tend to project how we are today into the future. So, for one thing, you talk about life extension, bizarrely, they automatically think that we're talking about living older and getting older and older and more and more decrepit. And of course, you would want to live like that. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about living youthfully and vigorously, in fact, better than we've ever been. Or well, they project other things remaining the same, not having any different technology, no better means of dealing with the environment. But the fact is that we've had environmental crises throughout human history. Back in the early Industrial Revolution, the British were burning all the forests to, for wood. But does that mean there are no trees left on the planet now? No, because we go through cycles. We learn new technologies, new ways of producing energy, and the same way we will respond to those challenges. So almost all these objections are based on this false idea that one thing will change and nothing else will. Well, they just can't imagine other possibilities. They can't imagine new technologies changing the rules as they have always done and will continue to do so.